This is Alyssa Apple, who is a researcher in the whole area of stress resilience. Mm -hmm. And my name is Dan Siegel, just so we Thank can you. introduce ourselves. Thank you. And this is a hard topic. Mm -hmm. And the topic is resilience in a time of climate crisis. And we have been a very emotional preparing for this talk because this is the first time either of us have given this talk either alone or together. And it's a huge, huge emotional talk. And emotion is a word for a process that has to do with meaning. Meaning and emotion are incredibly woven together. So the meaning of the climate situation is huge. Thank you, Dan. So we are not climate scientists. We are not gonna be giving you facts about the world. You all know them. We all know where we stand today. And we know that we can no longer talk about global warming. It's a global warming crisis. It's not the climate issue, it's the climate crisis. We have heard things like you have 12 years if you're going to turn this around and slow down the global warming, slow down the carbon pollution that we are emitting at the current rate. So we have for many years um, focused on science and science and technology and the answers will come from science, right? That's where we have sat, most of us aren't climate scientists, and so we've been passive observers of this situation. And yet everyone's different, I'm not talking for everyone in this room, but in general, we now know that the problem is not going to be solved just by science. In fact, we understand the problem and its solutions quite well, but rather it's going to be solved through a, a huge change in culture, and that means that starts with us and a change of mind. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So I want to uh, say before I start that I'm going to be talking slowly because these, these are overwhelming topics. And if I sp speak fastly, I will be reading to you without conveying the real issue. I won't be present. So I want us all to be present for each other tonight. This is a group experience. And that means that every, anyone has permission to cry. This is a time to really acknowledge what we're facing. Because through our awareness and acceptance, then we can move through that to actually see reality and action communally. And so as a society, we are, there, are, there is a tremendous amount of, let's just say, different emotional reactions that could be lethal, that block us from actually looking at reality and, and changing. So I'm going to talk about what does it mean to understand the mind? Where are the answers? So we'll be both talking for a little bit about the mind and the importance of integration. Now, the number one, one of the number one global causes, besides our individual carbon footprint that we are all creating, is the solution lies in understanding greed and the darkness of unfettered capitalism that is the big global course. I was, I had the um, interesting experience of being at Davos this year, and I actually had such feelings of kind of nausea and sickness to understand and see and meet the people who are the, the sea level people of multinational organizations that are creating, you know, the, the huge amounts of, of carbon pollution. And the most heartening thing at Davos, which is the World Economic Forum, so it's a yearly conversation, was a conversation between Jane Goodall and Greta Thunberg. Yeah, I know. I mean, boy, our, lead, you know, our heroes are, I mean, just to see them talking, this older, wise woman, one of our first environmentalists, and Greta, our 
brave Asperger young teen from Sweden. So do people already know who Greta Thunberg is? So she, she started the climate strikes on Fridays in schools and she's, she talked to our Senate last week and kicked butt of a senator with her knowledge. So, so that you know, we see uh, there are the big corporate forces. There is what Dan referred to earlier today, which is another a lethal error, which is the delusion that we have about ourselves, about thinking that we have this one brain and that self, and we're independent and separate from each other. And the reality is that we are so connected to each other that it's painful to actually see all of the connection and the sickness that goes with that, with the social inequities. We are from the, this earth. We are of this earth. And we are the guardians of this earth. And those answers, how to be the guardian of the earth and the next generations, this is not the realm of science. This is the realm of morality, spirituality, religion, psychology, all of these areas and people are desperately needed to help us with this conscious evolution that we need to make very quickly. Climate equity, intergenerational equity, these are the moral issues that are heavy upon us. I personally don't, I am fabulous at uh, not thinking about the enormity of it. And this is the, the next point, which is what we all are living with is an immediate sphere of personal crises and demands on our time. And it's that swirl, that daily swirl that demands a lot of our attention prevents us from seeing the big picture and making the changes we need to and connecting with each other about climate. And so there's, there has to be a shift of priorities. And so in my own little world, I have, uh, I, you know, I said for a long time, oh, if I chose another career, it'd be environment and climate. And that was kind of a, um, a very, let's say, dis distant idea of, oh, you choose a career. And now, no, 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 it's all of our job. We have to find the bandwidth. We have to find it in our own way. So I'm, I'm happy that my own little department of psychiatry is seeing enough mental health cases that now we have a climate task force and now we're trying to understand what we can do at our institution for people falling apart because of, of climate. Who falls apart? The most vulnerable members of society, people who already have emotion dysregulation, depression, and youth, people growing up with this cloud over them. So we, we, are, we are falling into a mental health crisis with climate change. One degree of warming is related to 4% increase in major mental disorders, depression and anxiety disorders. And that one degree is also related to 14% increases in aggression, group aggression. We already know that extreme heat creates anger and aggression. All right, so then the last point is this. Our brains are not equipped to deal with far, far future. So how are we gonna do this? We have our daily personal sphere of chaos and demands. What is it for you? You know, when you think of your daily sphere, you know, I often say, well, I've got work and I've got caregiving and, you know, fit in some other things when I can. And it's very easy to let yourself off the hook that way, but it's no longer what we should be doing. So what does this do to us psychologically? There's some science that may help to understand 
your own experiences are really all that matter, and we're going to explore that in a bit. So what do we know from research? We know that what is at play is that we are under, many of us are under chronic stress already. What we see are natural disasters across the world that are linked to the climate change, and they're going to be increasing. So we are, we think we're in it, but of course it, it's, we're at the tip of the iceberg. So there's climate trauma, there's events, and this can lead people to a whole range of emotional reactions, probably related to how close you are to the epicenter, and if you've experienced it directly. But just like 9-11, when 9-11 happened, <coughs> there was a national survey happening of blood pressure, and blood pressure went up nationally. So yes, it was highest in New York City, but the people over here on the West Coast felt it too, in their body. So what are we all experiencing? With the news that we hear, you might, you know, we might try to ignore it, we might be in our daily sphere, but we all are carrying climate distress. And how is that showing up? I had my first climate terror dream. That was really a sign to me that I'm not dealing with it consciously enough. That it's, things pop up in your sleep. They, they live in your nervous system. And if we don't talk about it and become aware and conscious of how to live with it, we can't move through it. So there is something, there's the, you know, a list of feelings, despair, eco-anxiety, shame. Shame at being collusive, we're all colluding. Our lifestyle is built around excessive use. Guilt, anger, hopelessness, helplessness. And what looks like apathy? And I say it looks like it because apathy is a result of climate anxiety. It is a defensive response that is not intentionally apathy. It just looks like apathy. Underlying it is uh, unconscious anxiety and stress that has not been dealt with. We know from terror management theory that when we feel threatened, our response to a threat to our life, to our existence, to our safety, causes us to push away other people. So we become much more xenophobic. We become much more alone. We don't want to be talking to other people about this. And that leads to isolation and loneliness. And that's how people with climate depression feel. So what happens? when we have all this range of emotion, we're frozen. We're incapacitated of moving together collectively in an empowered way. So some of the important things to remember are that even though we feel shame and guilt and we could do better every day, that it's not a personal failure. This isn't about you. This is about our human condition today, living today in our cities, in our modern society, we are all guilty together. And if we can reframe that away from guilt and shame, we can move toward this action, whatever that may be for each person, this collective action. So, so basically, we've been talking a lot about how we deal with sadness and stress every day and how that can coexist with a full life, still experiencing joy and love. And that's exactly what we need to do now. We need to acknowledge, feel, see whatever it is about climate that's triggering us. The sadness, there's mourning. There's mourning because things will never be the same. There is baked in climate change at this point that we cannot change. Some people feel a homesickness for how things were. So 
the anxiety plus an optimism that is not a choice that we must all grasp together can lead to action. So stress resilience requires a kind awareness and acceptance of what we are experiencing on the inside and outside and cultivating action over what we can control. So the Chinese word for challenge supposedly also contains the, the word for opportunity. And that's where we are today. And it's an inflection point where it can't just be certain people leading a movement, activists, it has to be all of us. So I don't like to swear, so I'm gonna let Rebecca Solnit, the writer, do it for me. <laughs> we can control a lot of our carbon footprint and each thing we do matters. It's not a black and white system. We are not fucked. It's a matter of how bad it's gonna be. We can prevent the worst. So what does that mean? Everything we do matters. And if you talk to climate scientists, our personal carbon footprint matters. Everything we do in our lifetime is going to affect how bad it is. So to be simplistic about this, we can think of two paths, a one degree warming where there's damage and we don't have the same world, but we have saved it because we have stopped dire warming or a three to five degree warming, which is absolutely tragic, which is dystopian. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dan. So let's pause for a moment and just feel what your body is feeling at this very moment after hearing these very powerful words and emotional expressions from Melissa. Just sense what you're feeling. Because the first place of really working with any kind of challenge is to be aware, to monitor what's happening. So let's just go around the room, if you want to do it popcorn style, just throw out a word of what your body is feeling, what's going on inside of you. And I'll repeat it so everyone can hear. Aggression. Aggression? Pressure. Oppression. Oppression, and you feel it right here in your chest, oppression. Fearful. Tearful. Stomach ache. And a stomach ache. Disappointment. Disappointment. Frozen. Frozen. Angry. Angry. Love. In love. Powerless. What's that? Love. Love. Mm -hmm. Powerless. Powerless. Yeah. Scared. Scared. So a wide range of feelings, some of them expressed as a bodily sensation, some of them articulated as an emotion, you know, scared, love, angry. Um, and the first place to begin in building what you're saying is to start where you are, right, to be there. Now, part of this aspect of knowing where you are is to know right in this moment where you are. Alyssa and I are here to join with all of you in a conversation that's very, very difficult. Facing the reality of climate change and talking about the stress of that and the resilience to cultivate is a really hard topic. Now, while that's in the moment. The first thing I want to say is that as you feel what you're feeling, it's really helpful to say, this internal state I have now can echo with things from my personal past. So if you were helpless in your past because of difficult attachment experiences or loss, um, then the helplessness of climate change issues 
may echo inside of you in a particular kind of way where the ability to tolerate helplessness may be so narrow that you quickly go to feeling overwhelmed and chaotic or going to apathy and shutting down in rigidity. And in that sense, this window of tolerance has pushed you through. So if you're young and this is going on, it's one thing if you're older. So um, two people left earlier when you're talking, which was a mother and a teenage daughter. And I have no idea what they said or why they were leaving. But my imagination was it would feel overwhelming. As it is, as you know, we have now higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide than ever in our youth. And there's probably many, many reasons for it. Disconnection and loneliness. People talk about how the internet has changed things. But climate change is certainly a part of it. So we start to ask ourselves the question, what is my particular area that's hard? So if anger was hard for you, that may be something you're not feeling, or it may be something you do feel. So to begin there, because ultimately what we want to do is see how to move forward. There's a wonderful term that a number of academics use called pervasive leadership. And pervasive leadership means that every human being can be empowered to take a leadership role. And here we're talking about climate change issues. So instead of feeling helpless, you don't have to be falsely optimistic. You can have what Alyssa and I would call optimistic realism. So if you read Paul Hawkins' amazing book, Drawdown, how many of you have Drawdown or know the book? Okay, literally just uh, uh, less than a handful. So this is a must-read book. And Paul Hawken, who's a colleague and a friend of mine, um, he's put together with a bunch of scientists the top 100 things that are being done to reverse carbon emissions, to reduce global warming, to try to make a difference and making a difference. And there's just an incredible optimism when you hang with Paul about what is being done, what can be done, by the idea of people taking leadership all around the world. And in fact, if you take the top 100 things and take the two of those 100 things that are related to females, to girls and women, educating girls, empowering women, if you combine the two gender-related things together, it's the number one thing on our planet if you want to turn climate change around, is educate females and empower them. Now that tells you a lot, you know? And so Paul Hawkins' work is incredible. You know, Joanna Macy writes an incredible book about world as lover and world as self. And all of her work is really about taking deep contemplative practice. She's been an ecological person forever. And her work is about holding that optimism and working together with inner wisdom and timely action. Or take the work of Mary Pfeiffer in the book called Green Boat. And what Mary says is, as a psychologist, is you've got to keep your eye on what your mind is doing so you don't get depressed and despairing and apathetic. And she says, and when you do it, you gotta do it together in community, and you gotta have a lot of pizza, gluten-free, for those of us who are gluten-free, and a lot of music, dancing, and a lot of fun. And this is the issue where you realize that this is really a collective effort. In the work I do with Peter Sangio and Otto Scharmer at MIT and our colleagues, we have a term we use called generative social fields. Now what's a generative social field? A field is a, a term initially uh, offered by Michael Faraday in the 1800s about electromagnetic fields. No one believed they existed. You know, and now we know in our electronics, they're all based on electromagnetic fields. Um, you may not see them in their eyes, but they're very real. So our view is that there are social fields in the way people relate to each other. 
And sometimes they're destructive fields, degenerative. And sometimes they're generative fields, which create connection, compassion, creativity, and collaboration. And so we're studying them in schools and seeing how we can actually try to make them happen because in our modern contemporary society, we don't have generative social fields. We have people living in isolation from one another with what Alyssa talked about, which I think is in a way the root of the problem, which is that the human mind in contemporary times has done its iceberg process where beneath the surface of our awareness and the surface of our language, we have categories, presumed divisions in the world of there being a self in this body and a self in that body that are separate noun-like entities. And that you build a concept based on those presumed divisions called categories. And that concept is, yes, there's selfhood that is like a thing that you have. And you have an identity about it and all this kind of stuff. And then you have even words at the tip of the iceberg that we can share with each other, like me and you, or us versus them. And this notion of self, that simple word, as a separate self, as a noun-like entity that's separate, is what E.O. Wilson would call an optical illusion, just a misperception, because of our reliance on the auditory and visual channels. We have the visual and auditory perception. Oh, you're over there talking to me. I'm over here. And that's an illusion. It's an inaccurate perception. And Einstein takes it one step further in that incredible quote you probably know about, where he says, the issue is there's an optical delusion of consciousness that we are separate from the rest. The rest being nature in all its beauty, the universe. And the issue here is that Einstein is pointing out that this view of a separate self is a psychotic belief. A delusion is a psychotic belief. And sometimes psychotic beliefs are lethal. Like if you believe in a state of psychosis you can fly and you go to a roof and you jump off and try to flap your arms, you're going to die and you might kill someone on your way down. So psychosis is lethal. I think that there's a lethal lie of the modern cultural view reinforced by parents, by schools, by science, and by society of the solo self, the separate self, the noun-like self. So part of this whole journey about climate change issues has to do with this idea of how you move into these generative social fields, realizing we all have something to offer. Collective intelligence always beats out individual intelligence, by the way. And we need to find each other's differentiated nature and then link together. Now, in that view, we have to move from only sustainability because we cannot sustain the current state. The current state is unsustainable. That word, while it infers something like, oh, let's make this a sustainable this or that, we need to take it a notch up. We need to think, how do we actually understand the deep nature of nature? Like, let's just talk about soil and regenerate soil, not leave it in its depleted state, right? So to go from sustainability to regeneration is an aspect of becoming part of a generative world. Now, what I want to say in the idea of what we do is something that really kind of shocked me. I was asked to speak at a climate change meeting. There were a bunch of policymakers in the audience. And before I came to give the opening keynote address, I told them I think they asked the wrong person to come because I wasn't an environmental scientist. I didn't know much about climate change. And I'm not sure why they asked me. And they said, no, you're the one we wanted. I said, well, what are you doing? They said, what we're doing has not worked. I said, well, what have you done? And they said, well, we tried to inform people. And it didn't work at all. I go, wow, it didn't work? No. What else did you try? They tried, we tried scaring people, like with Inconvenient Truth. Got Al Gore a Nobel Prize and an Academy Award. Less interest in helping the environment, with scaring them. I said, you've tried to inform people, it didn't work, didn't work. 
You tried to scare him, it didn't work, didn't work. I said, what do you do next? They said, well, that's why you're here. <laughs> and I went, you're kidding me. They said, no, we don't have any, we have no idea what to do. So I went, oh my God. <laughs> and I said, well, if you've tried to scare people, didn't work, you tried to inform them, didn't you work? I, the only thing I can think of is transform them. And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, this me thing, this separate self thing is gonna kill us. Maybe you can invite people to break the illusion of separation, to get out of this noun-like delusion of being a solo self, and invite people to realize you are a we, as much as you are a me in a body. You're this, now I would call it, I didn't call it back then, but I'm we. You know, me plus we equals we. So, you know, this is such a pressing issue for we that the next book that I'm writing is just going to be called We, you know? And every sentence I write in that book, which I've started writing now, um, is all about how do you transform the modern cultural experience of identity and belonging from a solo self, or even not just a singular noun self, but a singular um, a, a plural noun self. Because you can say, it's just me and my family, or me and everyone in my religion, you know? So part of the journey of transformation is to say, no, actually, it's you and all of humanity, and no, it's not just you and humanity. It's you and all of nature. All of nature. And the great opportunity where the challenge is the opportunity is that in some ways you could say the illusion and delusion of the separate self have created a kind of fog around contemporary life that makes people enter what a number of people call a hedonic treadmill. And it goes like this. My parents told me I'm Danny, I live in a body, and they say, although my parents didn't say this, but par many parents would, you know, the way to happiness is to get stuff, you know. So then you say, I'm gonna get 100 units of stuff. And I work really hard in high school, work really hard in college, get a job. Now I have 100 units of stuff. I don't feel very meaningful life, not very happy life. So then I figure, what's wrong? You more tell stuff. me. I need more, more stuff. stuff. 100 <laughs> was not enough, I just got the number wrong. So now I work really harder, harder, harder. And now I get 1,000 units of stuff, right? And I'm still unhappy. And then what do I think? More stuff. So now I wanna make 10,000 units of stuff. And when you're a therapist and you have some of these people run these companies in the privacy of their office, you know that they feel life is very meaningless and they're on this treadmill of supporting their five houses and all the other things they have. And you hear it from the inside out. Only the difference between someone who's just miserable as an individual, which is terrible, and someone who's miserable not caring that the factory that they own is polluting the world around us is a very different impact. But it's related to the same thing, because now you have three million units of stuff and you're still unhappy, so you gotta get five billion units of stuff, right? So this is what Alyssa talks about, what you call it, unbridled greed. The darkness of unfettered capitalism. The darkness of unfettered capitalism is that it's built on the, the cognitive iceberg of the category and concept of a separate self that's embedded in an entire modern culture that's built upon this materialistic view of what's gonna make you happy. When in fact the research shows that it's our relationships with one another that create happiness, longevity, medical and mental health. And when you're out in nature and you feel the awe of that, it brings in health. And you feel gratitude and compassion, it brings in health. These ways of expanding the self are exactly what we need.